So the stagflation of the 1970s had convinced many in the United States and elsewhere that Keynesian management of the economy, including a lot of regulation, uh, was simply not effective uh, and that a new model would have to be found. And this explains a lot of the shift to the idea that if we free up the market and eliminate regulation, let the market regulate itself, in fact, that everything would be fine. But there was one thing that the previous 50 years of economic management had certainly done well in the U.S. capitalist economy, and that was to prevent financial panics from happening. And we see a ton of financial panics in the years after the mid-1970s. Now, Ed, remind us what, um, what causes financial panics. Yeah, we see this uh, again and again. There are three key elements that need to occur for a financial panic to really build up and then explode. And those are quite simply, first of all, uh, a reduction or an absence of regulation in financial markets. Second, the emergence of new kinds of financial products, innovative ways to link uh, investors and, and buyers together. Uh, and then finally, uh, new era thinking, which is the idea that this time is different there's no way I can lose money. There's no way that values will decline and that stock prices will evaporate. And in financial panics, you can see a different kind of mentality than you normally see in markets. That in normal markets, when the price of a good goes up, demand goes down. And it's this mechanism that produces stability, right? That it allows supply and demand to equilibrate. But in financial, uh, financial excitement, in the, the mania of the bubble, as the price of an asset goes up, so too does demand. And in such markets, there can be no equilibrium. And this is what we see again and again and again. And we see the features of all this new era thinking, these new technologies in the 1980s with the rise of something called structured finance, the ability not just to turn mortgages into bonds, but to combine bonds and derivatives and options and all kinds of new ways that were never possible in the 1920s. They're only possible in the 1980s because of computers which can allow for complicated allocation of money in the form of tranches to different kinds of investors. So one of the things that we hear in the 1980s, we'll hear it later, of course, but one of the things that we hear is that this, in fact, all of these innovations actually make markets safer and less likely to collapse. So how does that work out in practice? Yes, exactly. And so this combination of structured finance and the desire to somehow create create reward without risk, results in something called portfolio insurance in the mid-1980s, in which it is believed that computers can protect your portfolio of stocks and bonds from collapsing if there's a sudden drop in price. But this is not what happens. So what happens when everybody thinks this is a great idea, gets portfolio insurance, and then a couple of stock prices start to drop? In instead of you selling just your stocks, all your computers everywhere begin to sell all your stocks. And so what we see is Black Monday in 1987, uh, the first massive crash in the stock market in that entire generation. And it is a portent of what's going to happen over the next 20 years in terms of financial crisis. And in that one day, enormous amounts of money are lost, but everyone brushes off, stands back up, and says the problem here is not that we are unable to protect against financial uh, panic, but that we had not done enough. We had not done enough structured finance. We had not been smart enough. And it's out of this moment that you really see the rise of the hedge fund. Yeah, and another development that's happening in the 1980s and that happens in the 1990s is that all around the world, more and more people are getting involved in financial markets, often in a very direct way. As barriers are knocked down, in part because of the actions of the IMF and uh, other international agencies that are promoting structural adjustment and promoting more access to the markets of these different countries, they're getting linked. They're getting linked by the access of their citizens to financial markets in other countries, by the access of people in the United States and investors around the Western world to the currency markets and other markets of those countries. Now, what ends up happening, however, is that this doesn't necessarily promote stability in those countries either. And so what we see is the rise of these sovereign wealth funds, these oil barons of both uh, the post-Soviet economy and uh, of the Middle East, and as well as the privatization of all these resources of the 1960s and 70s being invested in the American stock market. And so you have, on the one hand, this massive influx of capital that brings a, a relationship between all these different stock markets and economies that had never been before. They had not been correlated before. Um, and it, in this run up to 
2000, basically, you see the rise of these new hedge funds, especially long-term capital management, which is run by the best and the brightest, people who think that they can balance all these different economies against one another to eliminate risk and create return without any possibility of collapse. There's a series of small panics. They look big at the time, but they're building up to a much bigger series of panics. A series of small panics in the 1990s. Probably the one that kicks them off is the Asia crisis of the mid-1990s, in 95 and 96, and that leads into the collapse of a major hedge fund, long-term capital management in 1997, and then that's followed in turn by what's essentially the collapse of the new Russian financial economy between 1998 and 1999. And they all build up until 2000, where you have the collapse of what until then had been a real boom in tech stocks, both in the Dow Jones uh, market, the traditional Wall Street uh, stock index, and the NASDAQ, which is a new tech-based one. And there was a belief that the internet, whatever that was, uh, would be able to produce a wild new economy, and that something really had changed. Again, this new era thinking. And so capital from around the world moves to the U.S. stock market, and there's a tremendous boom. And suddenly, internet 1.0 doesn't deliver, and there's a collapse again. And it's out of this that people begin to look for safety, look for a place to put their money in which this kind of risk wouldn't exist. Yeah, and just like any, any herd of uh, panicked individuals, they all begin to think the same thing. They say, wasn't it ridiculous to think that the internet would produce a new economy in 1999, the way that, that we were thinking back then when we were all buying NASDAQ stocks? And of course, we know now that the internet did in many ways produce a new kind of economy. But they shift very quickly away from that. They turn their back on that kind of thinking and they say, here's something that's safe. Here's something that's always grown. And that is the U.S. housing market. House prices, they say, have never fallen for 50 years. House prices, they say, are protected by a whole array of financial innovations that spreads out risk through all kinds of bonds and insurance and derivatives. All of this means that this is the place to put our money. 